This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I speak with Bob Stromberg. We talk about mastering the craft of creativity, stand up and shadow work. Enjoy this episode. Hey, it's James Taylor. I'm delighted today to be joined by Bob Stromberg. Bob Stromberg is one of a very small group of artists who have stayed prolific and profitably busy for over 40 years. How's he done it? Well, by mastering the craft of creativity. In his online course of the same name, Bob shares profound, transforming disciplines that lead to a rich, personal reservoir of original ideas. And it's my great pleasure to have Bob with us today. So welcome, Bob. Thank you, James. Great to be with you. So share with everyone what's going on in your world just now. Well, I, uh, as, as you uh, said in the introduction there, I've, I've been doing this for 40 years. I actually travel and, and perform. I uh, mainly do uh, comedy. I'm a comic. Uh, the nature of it is, is storytelling. That's what I do. Uh, so I make people laugh all over the world, and, and it's been just a delight to, that, to do that for uh, my entire career. Uh, but I'm also I'm, I'm writing continually and creating continually. Uh, I'm podcasting now. I have a podcast called The Wide-Eyed Creative, and as you know, uh, podcasting is a time-consuming endeavor. So uh, that's been a, uh, something that I've, I'm doing every day and really, really enjoying that as well. And I was listening to an interview you did recently with uh, some of our friends over at the Kajabi over in uh, San, uh, San Diego kind of area, or California. Yeah. You said the interesting thing. You talked about how creativity is woven into our very genes. You also said that we are not born creative. So that kind of sounds like a there's a, a juxtaposition there. So my understanding of, of that we are what you were saying is that you were all born with a capacity for creativity, but that creativity itself is a craft or, or a skill that has to be developed. Have I, have I got that right or have I got that completely oh. wrong? No, you have it completely right. Uh, I really believe that creativity, uh, it is woven into our genes, but we're not create. We're not born creative. What we are born with is a capacity and a desire to be creative. And so we begin being creative uh, when, we're, when we're small, small children. I have people say to me all the time, you know, I'm, I'm not creative. My brother is or my sister is, but, I, you know, I'm the one in the family. I, I couldn't create anything to save my life, which... To which I say to them, well, you're probably right. I mean, if you, if you say so, then you're, you're probably not creative. You know yourself better than I do. But when you were a baby, one day you rolled from your front to your back and you couldn't wait to try it again. And then you got up on your knees and you rocked back and forth and then eventually you could crawl. And all of it was thrilling. And you learned to uh, pile blocks up and you learned to, to uh, use crayons on paper and, and, and you were exp- all the time experimenting. And as I always share in, in my own family, uh, our, our four-year-old, when he was uh, being creative, he took the little pink uh, magic marker and colored in all of the white flowers on our new, uh, on our new couch, <laughs> <laughs> which was a, an exciting day in our family right there. But this is creativity. Uh, and w- we all had the, have this gift aspect um, in, in our lives and it's woven into us and but it gets it gets I believe it gets educated right out of us mm-hmm. and, and most of us has gone by certainly by the middle elementary school years and I, I do not I don't have research myself to back this up but from my own experience with feeling this this uh, hit on my own creativity as a young boy my, with my own experience I, I believe that uh, it's because you get to school and you need to you, you discover very quickly that you need to write in the one right answer at the end of that question. Fill in the blank. You need to have the right word there uh, or you get the red check mark or you need to have the right number at the bottom of that mathematical problem or you need to to have uh, the, the right uh, box filled in. And if you don't, uh, then there are consequences, and you failed, and you 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 feel those things, and and pretty soon you realize that no, that I, I need to do it right. Where and the problem is creativity, it it just does not work that way. It's yeah. not compatible with that way of thinking. Creativity uh, requires us to look at all the possible answers. Some are better than others, probably always, but to look at all of them and then play with them to see which ones 
uh, work the best. That's that's yeah. the creative. What you uh, just process. remind me of it was that that Picasso uh, uh, quote, which has, I think it goes along the lines of you know we all, um, uh, we all creative, but the problem is remaining creative when you grow up. And there's and I think in the states and it's certainly the same here in in Europe. That uh, I think they call it the fourth grade slump. That that stage mm-hmm. when in kids just it, it, you know the creativity you start to see it you know decline and obviously there's there's, yeah. there's there's different reasons developmental reasons and other things that are going on as well just there so what you know for those people that are, that are listening just now who maybe have you know of a sense that that their their creativity they didn't really fully develop it you know it was there when they were young and they want to kind of recapture that as, as well what what are the, the fundamental disciplines that they have to kind of understand when thinking about their own creativity and maybe how to rediscover their own creativity yeah, th- thanks for asking that question. There are a lot of people just like that that you you mentioned, uh, and and I believe that most people have a sense that there's something missing in their life, and I really believe that's because they're not doing what they create. We we were created to do, which is to create. Um, and but you need to know those disciplines. You need to know the fundamentals. This will be the same with any with any skill. You need to know what the disciplines are and practice those to become skillful to, be, to master that skill. In the case of creativity, <clears throat> I say this is how you get G I T. This is how you get your masters of creativity. Uh, you grab first of all G. You grab anything that grabs you emotionally. And when I say anything, uh, I mean any emotions. Something, you see something and it, and it uh, makes you angry, or you hear something and it, and it tickles you, and you smile. You just write those things down. Now, these are not ideas. Sometimes they are, but usually they're just thoughts or experiences. You, you write them down. And you only write enough so that you can remember it. Saw the little girl in the shopping market, who uh, fell off the shopping cart? So I'm guessing um, that, that that part there, the 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 observation part, having your kind of antennae up. I know comedians like your comedian. You, you, you comedians, are all, I always think are, are really good at this because they're very observational. They're always looking for different things. But that often feels like you know for for the rest of us, that kind of gets dulled over a while. You know, as we get adults, you know, and life goes on and things. And is there anything around that grab? That's you know how we can. We restart the the antennae uh, going uh, going for ourselves. I, I think this is the process of of restarting the antennae. It's the, it is the process of learning how to get the antennae up again. It's not natural. I found this to be probably the most difficult of the three steps here to grab grab those things. And and the reason is they don't they don't feel like it's they're anything. Okay, this little thing just moved me a little bit. So you grab it. You write it. You write it down. Uh, but it's the process of grabbing that begins to wake you up emotionally mm. um, very quickly. This whole process of grabbing, and, and I'll jump ahead. It's grab, and then you interrogate. You interrogate that list to find the truth. Um, there's an aha moment, uh, and every creative person understands this aha moment. It's the moment that the thought that you grabbed or the experience that you grabbed and wrote down, uh, just a, a line or two, uh, the aha moment is when that thought becomes an idea, and every creative person has experienced this. It's like, oh my goodness, I know what I can do with. Oh, oh I can hardly wait to get started. That's the aha moment, mm. and then the actual creating it, whether it's writing the story or whether it's painting the painting or choreographing the piece, um, that's the transformational process. This whole grabbing and interrogating and transforming process, those are the three fundamentals of discipline. That middle stage, I, I know a lot of my friends who, the the ideas are coming to them all the time, but the, the challenge that they really they have a struggle with is interrogating the idea. So finding out of, of all these different ideas, which one do I want to pursue? Um, yes. So is there anything around that, that kind of middle stage, that interrogate stage that you talk about? You know, if, if someone's got having lots of ideas, but they just don't know how a way have a way to like how to process them and how to think about them, and how to find which one of these ideas should I pursue? Well, I w- normally for me, uh, it's, it's the one that jumps that jumps out at me. If I have a if I have a list and I do of 30 or 40 things in my grab file, as I as I go down through them, I, I can I can remember what 
the feeling that I had. Oh, yes, I remember that. I remember this. I remember that. But one or two of them will jump out at me. Okay. And and then it's just a matter of uh, take your pick. I mean, grab one and start and start working at it. Sometimes one will fit more with what you've been working on recently. It'll fit into a particular genre. So you go, OK, well, I'm working in this area, so I'm going to go that direction. So that's almost like moving it from the the, the intellectual thing, oh, this is an idea, to the to the emotional, to like, what? how does this, which of these ideas do I feel, which of the energy that I feel that is right to go, as a friend of mine, Derek Sivers, he said, it's either a hell yes or it's a no. <laughs> do I yes, feel really passionate right. about this? Or it's like, okay, it's no, it's no, it's, just, it's not going to make the final list. That's right. And, and normally you will feel much more passionate about several of them. And then and one of them is like, I, I've got to go at that first. Yeah. I've got to do that first. Yeah. Um, this process of grabbing, interrogating and transforming, really what this process is, it's, it's becoming emotionally alive. And this is what happens to us in those middle elementary school years. I, I believe that we get emotionally dumbed down or we start to die emotionally. This wakes us back up again. I was in um, with uh, my my show, uh, Triple Espresso, that uh, theater show that we did. We were in uh, Dublin, Ireland for almost two years at the um, at the uh, Andrews Theater. And every night I would walk home from the theater and I'd walk by an art store and there was a uh, it would be lit up, of course, in the darkness. And there was a, a beautiful light on this large box of, of um, pastel paints. And it was so beautiful because all the colors of you can imagine this are all in gradations of colors. So it's just beautiful the way the colors flow across the box. And I began to feel like some began to grab me just looking at those paints. I want to try it. I'd never done it before. I want to try those. I want to try them. Well, I didn't buy the whole box. That would have cost me thousands. But I bought a small box of, uh, of pastels and I began experimenting with the painting, which lasted about – Five years. I, it, it didn't. It, it only died because other things got in the way. It didn't die because I lost interest in it. But what what I discovered is, in about two to three months' time, actually in a month's time, it, I started to see it. But it got really strong in two or three months. I realized that I was seeing with my eyes and with my brain. I was seeing visually. I was seeing the world in a completely different way. I was seeing perspectives that I had never noticed before. Um, And part of that is you try it on the page and that doesn't look, that doesn't work. Well, it's because, oh, that's right. I can look, look what I'm looking at here. Um, I discovered that, that um, shadows are, are very often, most often not gray. Mm -hmm. I, uh, clouds are very seldom just white. Uh, The amazing thing I noticed that chrome, when I say to you, uh, James, it, it, okay, you're going to do a chrome bumper here. Immediately, you think of a particular color you would take out yeah. there and, and make, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Like, a, like a silvery color. Yeah, a silvery color. But bumpers aren't silvery. If you look at them closely, they are, they're very seldom not silvery at all, unless they're just reflecting the road. But go stand by a bumper, and the color of your shirt is reflected, the color of the sky, the color of the trees, the color of your shopping bag. Whatever you have is being reflected in that bumper, and that's what makes it look like chrome. I never had seen that before. Yeah. It was always there. Every time I walked by chrome my entire life, it was there. I never noticed it before. So the process of doing, of actually working with the pastels, it woke me up uh, visually. The same thing is true with this process of grabbing, interrogating, and transforming. As you do it, and it's not, it doesn't feel natural at first. It's like, well, why am I grabbing this? It doesn't mean a thing. Grab it anyway. Write it down. Mm. You begin to wake up emotionally. And pretty soon you realize when you develop a habit, and you've heard your whole life, as I have, that habits take three weeks to develop. And that neuroscientists now understand that that is actually true. It does take you. You actually grow a neural pathway in three weeks of doing something um, five to 16 minutes a day. If you do something intently, if you really work on something, think about something for five to 16 minutes a day, you grow a new neural pathway. It's not a strong one. It'll fall right apart unless you do it for another couple cycles, which brings it up to that two or three months time period. And if you do it for two or three months, uh, you have developed a strong creative habit and and you'll be grabbing things all the time. It's like the world, the world is yelling to you emotionally. 
that and that that you use that word um, intention as well within that. And I, I'm suddenly reminded of uh, Malcolm Gladwell, but obviously the ten thousand hours side of things. Yes, right. uh, from but the orig- the work the original uh, work that came from the original studies that that came from was a, a gentleman who said you know, his his work was kind of. Uh, change because it made for a better story uh, with the 10,000 hours but he said one of the things that isn't often talked about is having having the intention on looking to master something I mean you're talking about having that intention to master the craft of creativity it's no good just you know just picking up paints every day it's having having that kind of intention to want to develop to want to improve to want to see something that maybe you didn't see before yeah you're not just putting in your time in other words Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, the Beatles, when they put in their 10,000 hours, they, they weren't just putting in their time there. They were <laughs> they were having fun, which is interesting because being creative, when, when we are creative, even as adults, it feels like play. Yeah. It's so enjoyable. Uh, it feels like play. You know, some it's it, there. There are, uh, is an element of difficulty, certainly to it in, in, in the process. But it, it's so fun to be creative. And, and I believe everybody experiences that so you mentioned like the, the bumper there and that was just like a small kind of aha moment or a light bulb moment can you tell me in your in your career was there another kind of key light bulb moment an aha moment for you where you went ah oh, okay this is a, a new distinction uh-huh. or this is you recognize something in your work that there was potential for sure well first of all uh Discovering this process for me was a huge light bulb moment, which we can talk about. But one very specific thing that that applies to what you're asking, um, I was uh, speaking. I was doing comedy at a at a conference, a big youth conference. There were probably a thousand kids there, and we were meeting at a big ski area. And as it turned out, there was no snow, and it rained, and there was thunder and lightning, and the power went off. So I was doing my act one night, the power went off, and it stayed off. So, you know, the emergency lights came on, but we had to get kids out and went back to our to my uh, cabin that I was staying in. And there's, it, you know, the, there's no power. So I, wa- I wanted to to uh, take a bath. So I ran the, the uh, bath before the water got cold and there was a candle in the room. So I lit the candle. I sat down in the bathtub, lit the candle, put it on the edge of the tub. And as I'm sitting there, I noticed my shadow on the wall beside me. And and a candle, a small flame in a candle makes a beautiful shadow. I mean, even as you're thinking about this, I'm sure you can mm. see it in your mind, just, just how black a shadow is and how crisp it is when it's when there's one candle. And I held my hand up and began moving it. And I put my other hand up and began moving it along with that hand. And before my eyes, uh, the shadow of a gorilla appeared. And I mean... I, I, I mean, it, it actually looked to me like the actual shadow of a gorilla. It wasn't like, it didn't look like a hand shadow of a gorilla. It looked like a, a shadow of a gorilla. And I was, I was so excited. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And I, and I didn't dare move my hands. I'm just frozen there. Like, I'll, I'll forget this. And so I very carefully took them apart, keeping them in the same shape, put them back together. Well, there it is again. And I memorized that shape until my hands were cramping. And in fact, I even got up in the middle of the night and tried it again just to make sure it was there. The next morning, we went in the theater where we were meeting, and I had the spot operator put a, a, a round circle of spotlight on the back white wall I was working against. I had the video operator focus in on my hand shadow, and I said to a thousand teenagers, um, okay, check this out. And I made the shadow, and they went nuts. They just <laughs> went crazy. <laughs> and, and that was one of those aha moments where I went, oh, boy, have I got something here. Uh, if I if I want to if I want to take the time to work at it, well, I did, and I learned how to. I created the equipment I needed to to do this as I traveled. Something I could put right in my case with me that didn't take up too much weight. The right kind of light, the right kind of screen, the right kind of stands, and then I worked literally for two years. I worked um, probably three or four days a week. I spent my five to sixteen to thirty. Minutes. You really can't practice hand shadows much more than that because your hands cramp up every time you. It's like learning guitar. When you try a new guitar chord you've never played before, your hands are going to cramp. Same process. And I got all of this muscle memory in my hands. And then about two years later, I thought, okay, here we go. I'm going to try this. And I was on a on a stage, and I put together a short, maybe four or five, three or four minute piece because I didn't want to. I didn't want to create a 
10 minute piece and have it fail with too much time <laughs> in an hour show. So I put a three or four minute, I thought I can squeeze it in here. So it won't, you know, if it doesn't go well, I can just sort of laugh it off and we'll all have some fun with it. And people went crazy. And that, so that's become now over the 25 years, it's really become a, sort of a calling card for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I was on a, a, this show with the Steve Harvey. I'm 65 years old now. So, um, Steve Harvey had a show this uh, last summer called uh, Little Big Shots Forever Young, where all of the talent has to be over 60 years of age. So I qualified. I was on the way young age of that in this show. But uh, but it was the shadows. If it had been my doing comedy, I probably wouldn't have had that opportunity because there are so many comics and so many storytellers like myself. But there's not one that does what I do and does shadows on top of that. So that that was a wonderful aha moment for me. But that's the process, by the way, of grabbing you. It moved me emotionally, that shadow. It grabbed me and I grabbed it back. That was one that became an idea right away. But I'm guessing also there's times where you, you, you're working on something and, you know, you're, you're trying something out and trying different ways and it just doesn't quite work. And uh, can you maybe give it is, is an example of that where you, you maybe had the, the kernel of an idea, you, you tried it and for whatever reason, it just didn't work out like you'd hope. Or maybe it was a, pro, you know, end up being a, a full project and it was out there. And it just didn't, didn't quite work as you'd hope. And more importantly, what were the lessons that you took from that experience and learned from that experience? Well, if I can, uh, something ju- uh, comes to my mind immediately because I still emotionally feel this. Uh, this is something that did work, but I realized I, 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 had, I, I couldn't do it. I had made a mistake. Um, I started podcasting only three months ago. I'm 20 podcasts in now, and, and I'm, I am just loving it. Um, but I, I decided early on, and this is very typical the way that I would think I want each podcast, I want each podcast to be a little artistic gem. I want this to be something that people will want to listen to that one over and over and over again. I mean, I know you feel the, the same way with your, your certainly. So I had decided I'm going to sweeten these with music. I'm going it, to, it's going to be just be this little piece of art. Um, so I had a story about, what the Beatles meant to me as a, as a child and how that had affected me. And I'm thinking, well, I, I've got to have, I sh- how, how do you do this without having, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about how I dropped the needle on that meet the Beatles album. And, and, uh, well, she was just 17 comes on and, and it just, how do you do that without playing the music? So I looked at YouTube and I realized, well, well, she was just 17. Um, there are a hundred, a hundred people have videos of with that song in it. And I thought, well, that's interesting. How can they have their, they've got this Beatles song right on YouTube and a million people have listened to these things. It must be legal. How stupid could I be? You know, I mean, obviously there was something in the back of my mind goes this, well, this isn't possible. It's not possible that I'm actually legally able to use this music. <laughs> it's the Beatles. But, um, I thought, well, you know, I'll I'll put it together. Well, I I got so creatively into this process and was having so much fun creatively that I I made this 25-minute piece about what the Beatles meant to me. And it was filled with Beatles music, but but it really worked. I had a young uh, friend of mine who – not a young friend, but a middle-aged woman who went to see U2 recently. Uh, She'd always wanted to see them. And she had written a a piece about about that uh, experience. And I and I said, hey, Joy, how about if I took the piece you wrote and create a podcast about that? And you can read it for me and I'll sweeten it, which I did. And I created the sense of the U2 uh, concert with U2 music. Mm. And then uh, I had 10 of these and all of them had unlicensed music in that. And so, I don't I don't know how it's possible. I think I was just creatively blinded. Uh, I was having so much fun. I was blinded by this process. And then I was on a podcast like yours. And um, I said to the podcaster, well, listen to my podcast, The Wide Eye Creative. I think you'll really like it, which he did. And his comment was, you're in a really dangerous place here. <laughs> so I had I had to uh, – and, of course, as soon as he said it, I went, of course I am. I, I know this sound, it probably sounds like a small thing to your listeners, but it, it takes – you know, it takes – it was taking me two or three days of work to make yeah. one of these podcasts. And then I had to go back and re-edit all of them. But now I couldn't use the Beatles music. I had to use something else. 
And it couldn't be Beatle-like. It had, in other words, I had to create the piece in a completely different way. And going back and re and recreating was much more difficult yeah. than creating because it. I was in the middle of the, of, frankly, of the grieving process. Yeah. Of, of this piece is gone. I'm throwing it away. So. It, it, that's so. It's so challenging, especially when you have have an idea, and and you know where your work starts and someone else's work ends. It's, so, it's difficult, almost to discern because you're you're almost like co-creating at a certain point. And I know, obviously, in American law, you have. Uh, a fair use policy for educational and you know purpose and there's certain things you can get away with but it's a minefield my wife is an intellectual property lawyer and it's, it's an, an absolute minefield of that area as well and sometimes it's obviously the you know these short-term monopolies copyrights are there for very good reasons and to reward the the creators but other times it feels like it's it can actually sometimes inhibit the the creative process as well so my oh, my thoughts are with you absolutely. there so actually we're talking about online resources about youtube there as well do you have any online resources or tools or apps that you find really useful and you really love working with oh you know what the most useful one to me and i use it multiple times a day in ver- in, in different ways is one that came right with my iphone iphone it's the notes mm. app um, I use it continually. I have a couple different grab files there where, where I'm grabbing. I, I just pick my phone up and I talk it in. And it's just, just enough for me to remember what I just grabbed, what, what grabbed me emotionally. I'm interrogating those things all the time. If um, I'm often having to write introductions, or, or intros, or outros to things. Uh, or preparing for uh, things that are coming up, or or show lists when when I and and I've got all those lists in there, and I'm I'm working in that all the time. Um, I've also found something that I, I've never seen anybody else do do this, and and maybe it's 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 because it's not anybody else's need. But I've had a lot of people on airplanes and a lot of. Uh, uh, flight attendants say, well, that's a clever thing you have. Uh, when I got my new computer, it came, of course, with a new wireless keyboard. I have a, I have a Mac and it has this little silver uh, white, white key, keyboard with it, um, Bluetooth. Oh, well, it connects to my phone. I had an extra one then. So I, I carry that I just carry that keyboard in my carry-on and my phone in my pocket, and I type away in notes, I type away um, – uh, on all of my trips, I'm working yeah. on things in, in that note file, and I don't have to carry my computer with me. I don't have to take it out of the case. I don't, you know, when I'm going through TSA, I, I just all I have is my keyboard. It's inside there. It weighs nothing. It's as thin as can be, and and then I I put the Bluetooth on with my phone and use it. It's so useful. I've never seen anybody else do that, and most of the flight attendants haven't haven't either because they comment every single flight. Well, look at that. What are you doing? <laughs> and you were mentioning that you were mentioning the Beatles there as well. Can you recommend as a, if the, you could recommend one album and one book to our listeners? What would they be? Well, the, let me give you uh, instead of one album. Let me give you let me give you two books. Um, uh, that, that come to mind immediately. Uh, in terms of creativity, the book Art and Fear by David Bales and Ted Orland. Art and Fear. It is, it's just a gem. Uh, and, and probably the most um, fun book that I've ever read on creativity. And it really is a, uh, uh, it, it's a primer in, in, in anything creative is Steve Martin's autobiography of his stand-up years. He doesn't go into his movie years. It ends at, at when he starts, when he ends his stand-up career. But it's called uh, Born Standing Up. Yeah. And it is, uh, it's, it is really, a, a, it's a gem in terms of learning about creativity, how it works. A lot of people, you know, this process of what I call grabbing, interrogating, and transforming, of, of mastering the craft of creativity, that is, um, every, that, I, I honestly believe that that's something that every creative person uses, but not many even know what that process is. I think a lot of creative people are, uh, they're just using it intuitively. Mm. Um, it's just, uh, they found it, it's there, but they, they haven't taken the time to think about, well, what is it I'm actually doing? And, but the problem, and, and that's fine. It's great. As long if you're intuitive that way and it works, but the problem is you will run into um, a wall at some point where all of a sudden it's not working anymore and you won't know why and you won't know how to get out of it. Um, I, I tell the story, I, I recently heard the TED Talk by, um, by Sting and he talked about having an eight-year dry spell okay. where he could not write a song and he said, my muse had gone away. And I kind of smile and I go, no, no, no. 
you know, Gordon, there's no muse. There is not a muse. It's a process that as great as you are and with all your platinum albums, you didn't understand what the process was because if you did, uh, you wouldn't go dry. Yeah. You would go back to your grab list. It reminds me, a little, we talked about music a little bit earlier, you know, those those great... Um uh, uh the uh, carol uh, uh uh carol kings of of this world and i'm trying to remember the name yeah. of that street that uh, tim pan alley uh in the states mm-hmm. and then we had a similar one in the uk in denmark street but there was a phrase that they always had which was said inspiration is for amateurs yes. um and so they would go in and it they they, they truly tra- tra- uh, felt it was a it was a, a, a craft they were going in they yes. were going in to work at the craft and every day some days would be better than others, but you were going in continually work, you know, and if you were blocked, for, you know, and you couldn't, you couldn't write anything, frankly, you would write about being blocked. And, yes. and, and you would, think you about did. this. Carol King was, Carol King was 15 or 16 years old yeah. and she was already be actually learning the process instead of just going with what she was feeling. She was learning a process, which is, which is great. And think about this too, when Sting, the way that Sting got out of his eight year slump, was he began to hear in his mind the dialect of the people who grew up in his shipbuilding town there in the UK. And he began writing little ditties in that dialect. He'd never written in dialect before, but he wrote in the dialect the way those people spoke. And then he wrote another and another and another. And that became, he couldn't stop writing. Yeah. And that became The Last Ship, which was his Broadway and, and uh, a West End show that he did. And now is, is going to be going all over the world for, I'm sure, for for decades as we start to finish up here i want you to imagine that you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch so you've got all the tools of your trade all the, the knowledge and the skills that you've acquired over the years but you know no one no one knows you you have to restart what would you do how would you restart things um <clears throat> I, I feel i feel like that's what i do <laughs> every morning I feel like I feel like every morning I get up and I am and I am re restarting or I mean, I'm I'm continuing. But I I feel like I'm 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 empty every morning except for what I have, which is this which is this process. Um, If I lost my grab my grab uh, list, if that was gone, I would start grabbing again. If if I had the knowledge of the creative process, um, I feel like I would be okay. I feel like that's what sustains me every day as it is and if everything was taken away that that would still be there well bob we were mentioning obviously the the, the course that you have talking about grab interrogate and transform this this course uh, mastering the craft of creativity where should people go to find learn more about that to find out more about that and also about your other projects that you have yeah i'm going to put together a i'll put together a special web page just for your listeners and uh it will be uh, bob stromberg the way it sounds, it's spelled B-E-R-G, bobstromberg.com forward slash creative. Uh, and that'll just be for your listeners. Wonderful. And if they if they go there, there's there are several resources. There's a there's a fun um, a multiple choice quiz. It will take literally 60 seconds uh, to uh, complete. And uh, it's called Are You As Creative As Steve Martin? And, <laughs> and, and I realize that most of your listeners uh, pro- think they probably already know the answer to that question, but uh, it's, it's, it's kind of revealing. So that is there. Uh, there's a 30-minute training video introduction to Mastering the Craft of Creativity, but it's a 30-minute uh, free training video, and it's, it's loaded. I really loaded it with content. Um, the, and then the course is there as well that you can you can check out a video on that uh, too. And then um, and I'm I'm podcasting at the Wide Eyed Creative, and that of course is on iTunes or anywhere else that you want to want to find it. We'll put all these links on, on the show notes so people can just go if you go to jamestaylor.me, just type in Bob Stromberg, and we'll have all these links here as well, so people don't have to. If you're if you're in the car just now wondering, oh, I need to, I need to write this down, they'll all be in there. Just go look look for Bob's name, and you'll be able to get all these uh, these links we're talking about. So Bob. Thank you so much for coming on on the show today. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you and about speaking about the craft of creativity. I wish you all the best with your course and all your other creative projects you have on the go. Right back at you, James. Thank you. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.